Hello, everybody. <laughs> um, if everybody could just make sure that they signed in, that would be great. Um, and then for the people joining us online, if you could let us know if we're projecting enough, because we want to make sure you can hear us as well. Um, but we're going to go ahead and get started. It is so good to be back in person. It's been quite some time for uh, some of us. I was here for the curriculum night and it was so great to feel the energy, like all the parents were, you could tell like people missed each other through what we've been. It's kind of like everything tastes a little bit sweeter. Um, I wanted to uh, introduce Hideko Szymanski and Donna Griffin. Um, they're joining our team. Thank you so much. Anybody else who wants to join uh, Stacy, Angela, and I and get involved and um, for you at home, please let us know. You can just send us an email. We'd love to have you and we need your help. Um, a couple of weeks ago, we met as a team and we also met with Libertyville Connect. And some of our ladies are here with us tonight. Um, we are, we always uh, want to build this collaborative partnership. So Libertyville Connect is a, a, a partnership within itself with Lake County Health Department, LHS parents and LHS. Um, and the, their premise is drug and alcohol usage education focused. So a lot of times mental health um, and drug and alcohol use go hand in hand. So uh, our next meeting will be Wednesday, November 17th, where we will be talking about um, drug and alcohol usage and men mental health. Our meetings are typically every third Wednesday of the month. Uh, so we have sent out a parent survey, um, September, Angela, is that? And due to, from all the parents' feedback. And we had a we, lot of feedback, you guys. We were so impressed. Parents really responded. Yeah. Um, so we heard you. We're going to build our content around the issues that you have brought to our attention. So please join us. We're gonna bring back our student panel, which is always so dynamic to hear from our kids. Follow up with what can we do now that we have those nuggets. Um, we will also be talking about the whole college, what that landscape looks like uh, now, because it keeps changing even from a couple years ago. So please, please join us and put us on your calendar for third Wednesday of every month. Check us out on Facebook and we will update our website on the LHS site. So. Today, we are going to talk about helping teens navigate um, through this pandemic. We can't say it's you know post-pandemic because we're still kind of going through it. So our new normal. And we have Gina Tober who's been with us several times uh, through our discussions over the past couple of years. She's awesome. And we want to pick her brain about what kids have been going through the past 18 months. And now that we're transitioning back in, what does that look like? So I will uh, just start asking you some questions, if you don't mind. <laughs> so what issues have you seen coming through for this, the high school age group? So just for some reference, if anybody doesn't know me, I'm a counselor. And so I've been working for the about, practicing for about the last 15 years. And I really um, specialize in teens um, and have seen teens through many different stages. Um, hope everybody can hear me good. Um, and so one of the pieces that I see significantly that has increased one, just the fact that more teens are seeking services. And so that's not necessarily a bad thing because the stigma for mental health has really never been as low as it currently is. Um, you know, employers are pushing it, parents are receiving it, um, celebrities are talking about it. Those people that our teenagers are looking up to are, are you're hearing all these positive like pro therapy pieces, even Simone Biles is talking about therapy, right? Mm -hmm. So the stigma is decreasing. The modality that teenagers like online has increased for behavioral health services. And so that has also made it significantly easier. They're not necessarily dependent on their parents to drive them back and forth, or they can fit it in between their social um, and extracurricular pieces. But we're also noticing the reason that more teens are coming in is because they're having way more anxiety. 
and their lives had changed really drastically. And typically what has happened in the past is, you know, there might be big stressors that are coming along for our teenagers, um, but everything else is kind of stable. And what has happened is these big stressors has, have come along and nothing was stable. It wasn't stable for adults and it wasn't stable for them. And so I'm seeing a ton of anxiety coming in throughout the pandemic. A lot of it was um, parents were noticing their teenagers were withdrawing, not wanting to go to school. Lots of teenagers decided to continue um, again. Um, and parents were a little concerned about their teenagers re-engaging in socializing and face-to-face -face learning. Um, so primarily what's going through our um, anxiety about returning to school, some social issues. I know we're gonna talk about um, the fact that school last year was easier and this year is not, um, right? And so trying to manage that pressure and, and managing this like new normal of how everybody is gonna function. Um, so I'm seeing a lot of those pieces come in. Mm -hmm. um, we had talked about uh, it's hard as parents to discern sometimes if we should make something a big deal um, versus how do we coach them through something. Mm -hmm. So we talked about big emotions. Um, could you explain a little bit about that, uh, what these kids are feeling and how at part two will be how to discern what's big, a big what's deal big and what's, what's not. Yeah. Everything is a big deal, but <laughs> it might not be stay a big deal. So teenagers, um, a couple of important pieces to note is just general, there's social development going on and then there's brain development going on. And so you have the teenage brain, which has its emotion center, its amygdala is completely fully formed. By the time they're a teenager, it's completely fully formed. It's, it's like, it's buzzing, it's fully charged, it's ready to go. But that judgment piece that prefrontal cortex, the, the piece that we all like to think we have really good solid prefrontal cortexes, we make really good solid decisions and think about the future, that's still forming into their 20s. And then the other piece to understand about that is the link between your emotion center and your decision-making center, your judgment, that's still being filled in. And so as they grow, that turns in, goes from basically like a country lane to the expressway. So I, we have a big emotion. My boss said something really mean to me and I really want to curse her out or tell her where she could, you know, put that paperwork. But, but I say, oh, well, I really need this job because I need to pay for my mortgage and I need to do these things and my kid is in college. And, and so I'm just going to say, oh, I didn't appreciate that instead of saying what it is that you really want. But teenagers, they don't necessarily have that same structure that's built in. And so everything is super, super intense and big to them. They're probably more emotional than they'll ever be, right? They're, they're having great highs, they're having really low lows, and they're bouncing kind of back and forth. And sometimes it's hard to manage, particularly as adults. Um, but we can definitely see that in they feel something, they make their decision based on their emotions, and then they kind of back lay it with their thinking. Oh, well, the reason that I that I cursed my friend out was because this has really been building up for a really long period of time. And versus that I'm thinking about how I can solve this problem and I solve the problem. They're really responding from that emotional state. And that's what they're supposed to do. That's where they're developmentally supposed to be at. And it helps them learn their boundaries and it helps them continue to develop those pieces. And sometimes if you yell at your best friend, she yells at you back. And so then they're learning those social dynamics. Yeah. So how as parents can we discern when it's something that we need to jump on or when it's something to, you know, lay back on because we can make the situation worse mm -hmm. because we're displacing our anxiety and our worry when to them inside, it might not be a big deal or they just need to get it out. Mm -hmm. And once it's out, okay, I've released the power, just like we know as adults, how do we know when it's serious and when it's okay to? And in the, in the moment, you might not because it's so intense for them. Mm -hmm. And so some of the big pieces that come to my mind are those social conflicts or those being left out or what is very triggering for us as parents is when other kids are mean to our kids, 
or they say something hurtful or they're left out of something that you really want them to be included in. Um, because there are kids and we love them. We adore them. We think they're amazing. Everybody should love them. Um, I know I do with my kids. You all would love them. Uh, but it can be really upsetting for us as our kids are left out or things are going on. So they're expressing to us this big, really huge problem for them. And it's our responsibility as a parents to check ourselves and respond in a calm fashion back because it might be a 10 today, but it might be a two tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And so one of the pieces um, that I see a lot for parents is trying to determine, is my child just having a difficult time with this event right now? Or is this like chronic anxiety or is this chronic depression? Should I really be worried about it and be looking at some like additional um, supports or services or medication? And so when we're looking at like chronic depression versus big emotions, we want to look at those two weeks. So is this something that was triggered by a very specific event? And are, is that consistent over the span of a week? So if there is a big argument with your teenager and their friends, or they got left out of something and they're very upset, or if you have a junior, if you have a freshman or sophomore and their, their friend groups are breaking up, um, which is very, very common at that age, um, it can feel like the whole world is flipping up. My best friend is not my best friend. And these people are talking bad at me. I'm not in the group chat, chat anymore. And so a lot of those pieces can feel really, really difficult in the moment. And then a couple days later, you're like, hey, how are things going? And you're like, oh, it's good. I'm going to go out with the girl that right. was really, really mean to me three <laughs> days ago. And we're best friends. And we're thinking about getting matching necklaces. <laughs> you're like, what? <laughs> But that's how their relationships are going. And so when your child is bringing something big to you, don't think, oh, well, you'll figure this out. Like, this will be fine. Sit there with them, but be mindful of the fact that you're modeling for them how they need to manage their big emotions because they're going to they're gonna be really big. And so listening to them kind of talk it out, whatever it is that they want to do, don't problem solve. I know we talked about that before. Um, anybody participated in last year mm. your children are really smart like I I am telling you this now your children have a ton of capabilities to solve their own problems and they've probably already thought all of the solutions to the problem but they're having a hard time landing on it because that emotion is just so big for them and so talking to your child about how can we manage what we're doing now and if you have a great relationship with your child and you talk about mental health issues or talk about what they can do to calm down you can prompt them with those things some of us that's an awkward conversation to have and sometimes it's not like okay let's sit down and take a couple deep breaths together some some parents don't have that relationship and some kids will not receive that feedback well and so we can also be a little sneaky about having our kids do something to physically relax so like oh i'm i'm on my way to the kitchen like come with me i'm gonna get out whatever their favorite thing is to eat okay so we get up from the location we're at we walk down we give them a glass of water or something to drink because we want to start changing their body chemistry and so it starts to help them regulate their physical body and then once their emotions are getting regulated and their physical sensations are getting regulated i guarantee you they're going to come up with some solutions I guarantee it because yeah. they already know what they are. That is one thing that we heard from our student panel um, last year is they were saying, Ma, I promise you, before you even come at me with, how's your day? Oh my gosh, what happened? Da, 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 da. We've already thought 30 ways how the situation could have played out, what I could have done differently. Da, 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 da. So you bring up two things that um, I love as far as strategies or tools. One thing you said in the past too was neutral face. Mm -hmm. So I wish I had known that um, 25 years ago, <laughs> no. uh, that when your kid comes at you with the problem, like even though you might be mortified inside, just have like a neutral face so that you're not making their anxious, you know, um, anxiety bigger. And then you also said, is it a two or is it a 10? So it's like helping them put it into perspective 
how big the situation really is. Um, parents also said, is it gonna matter 10 days from now, two weeks from now, six months, just to help them put um, things in perspective? It's another uh, great point too. I wanna to address something that came up. Um, there was an incident that uh, people may or may not know about, depending on um, if your kids were there or talked about it. But a couple weeks ago, our students and students from an opposing school, um, there was an incident where I think it escalated. So it started at a home football game. The following week, it turned into um, an altercation and it, it was at a different game. And it was something, some people were very troubled by it. Some kids didn't even know about it. Um, I want to get your opinion on how did how did this all of a sudden come to a boiling point over the course of a week, but then also um, is is it COVID related? I mean, being uh, shut down for eighteen months and then all of a sudden they're together and this I don't know if it's mob mentality or big emotion came through. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to get your take on that. And from my understanding, there were, you know, loads of teenagers who are not making excellent decisions. But we can all probably recognize that our society is getting more polarized and it's more us versus them than maybe it has been in the past. Um, I know I'm very, very young, so I don't know any of that kind of history stuff. Um, but as things have become more polarized, we live in these echo chambers where we only hear the things that we want to hear. If you think about where teenagers are getting their, um, their, their interacting with the world, it's through their social media, it's through TikTok, it's through all these sites that algorithm them um, to the same information. So it's just echoing back and back to us. I mean, we saw it in some of the political stuff in the past. And now it's becoming more and more noticeable and aware. Um, and now it's a, like a joke. I, many of you are probably on TikTok. My sister sent me this TikTok <laughs> and it was her, it was a woman holding her phone and saying, my birthday is coming up. And she says, diamond ring, diamond ring, necklace, necklace, necklace into her husband's phone as in, and then <laughs> the expectation is for it to populate up those items, right? And it's hilarious, but we all recognize that's what's going on. Mm -hmm. And you're like, now I know. <laughs> airplane mode. Airplane mode. <laughs> yeah, really good. Um, but as we're doing those things, our society is more like that. And teenagers, they have to test boundaries and they push things too far. And they didn't necessarily get the opportunity to push things too far and learn last year because they were pretty much seg like segregated in their own space looking at things online, their social connections really started to wither down. You probably all saw your kids like lose some of those fringe friends that like could have been good friends or might have been like a Kate, like acquaintances. And you're like, oh, I really hope that they start hanging out with them more because they seem like a kid that's got it going on. And they lost a lot of that. And some of that's not bad because the some good friends stuck with them, right? They were able to like continue to grow those relationships. Um, but you lost a lot of that, oh, okay, you're not gonna agree with everything that I say. And so coming out and seeing that these kids are making really bad decisions, not overly shocking, because they always do. So I live um, in the Lake Zurich um, high school area. And so we had a kid make a joke on social media about um, safety in the school, right? And so it was like this big thing. They closed all the schools. They closed the schools for my kids, which are not even at that high school. Um, and so we see these things every year. Um, and part of that is kids trying to learn where their boundaries are and getting very into being othered and making poor decisions, getting wrapped up in this, like, oh, we're going to get them and this is going to be you know, it's us versus them, it's us versus them. But I would really, from my um, professional and personal place where I'm sitting here, I, I would say we should look at these kids still with a load of 
kindness. Because even though they're making terrible decisions, it doesn't make them a bad person. If we were all judged and, and held to our worst decision that we ever made, it would be pretty ugly. And now we can do that because in social media, we can block people. We can put them up. We can say, this person is really bad and we all need to blacklist them. We all need to stop talking to them. We need to get them kicked off social media, right? And so it's not, you make one bad decision, you're a bad person. Um, and, and so there's that back and forth of othering people and not allowing people to have that, that gray space. Mm -hmm. By no means am I saying solve things with fights or um, berate people or do things that are hurtful. But I, I think as we, as adults are looking at the situation, having those conversations with our kids, what do you think was going through their mind? Like, what was the impact of all that? What do you think they think now? Like that is a treasure trove of information. If your kid is upset by it or they had no idea and they're like, what, what happened? That's a great space to start having those conversations about why do you think this happened? Like, how can we, how can we work on this? What is the impact? is this problematic? Is it not problematic? Mm -hmm. And having a lot of really growth related conversations based off of that incident. Yeah, no, that's, you bring up a lot of good points. Yeah, um, so just going back to big emotions and how can parents help? We talked about um, having these conversations, especially around, you know, looking at opportunities where we can have some of these timely conversations. Um, when they're in the midst, yeah, please. Just because after what you've said, um, one of the reasons that I do this group, and I know that everyone else does it, is because just what you just said, I feel like if everyone in this room went home and talked to their kid around that incident, like, look at how many kids would then go back into the school with, like, an idea of, oh, we're not going to do that. Like, they are, because you get them to think about it, and maybe the next time, oh, they've already thought about it and that's not going to happen. And if we could spread that like to other parents, like I think that's how we could make the change that we need in our culture mm -hmm. at our school. Yeah. So. Great point. What was the incident? There was a fight at a hockey game. See, we didn't name them. Yeah. Yeah. There's some people. A boy actually punched a girl from the other team, like the, a spectator. It, it was at it was at yeah it was, it was at Glacier, so it wasn't because hockey doesn't isn't a school centered like sponsored team. It was at Glacier, but it was with the other school. They were taunting like like they taunted so much that I think this kid finally lost it, but punched a girl. So it was pretty bad, and apparently the video is horrific, and 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 you don't want. It. Like it's pretty shocking to see the behavior from both, yeah. from both sides. Yeah, and I from think um, that is the it is like forced. I think yeah. we we're trying not to say that. Yeah. School. <laughs> For those at home, we're just talking about the incident. I don't want to make it yeah. about them, you know. Yeah. Like so, it, but yeah. that is the incident. From what I understand, both um, schools, the parents, the players are embarrassed, are disappointed, you know, I think about the fan behavior. Um, and I think they are also talking with this, the students who are involved, but also having conversations of how as a school and as a student body, we can elevate from, and what do we learn from that, that incident? Um, so just to recap, when our kids are going through these big emotions, um, how can we help them? You also mentioned uh, like taking them from, you know, if, if you're sitting on the couch, taking them out of that space to kind of redirect their thoughts or to, mm -hmm. to but is there anything else you wanted to add? Um, one of my, well, I think we're gonna talk about that a little later. I don't wanna jump ahead. <laughs> I'm like very excited about all this. Um, <laughs> modeling behavior. Can I ask I something know. that goes along with this? So I think this will target right to the point of how do you build a teenager's resilience in a moment like that? Mm. And I say this because, like you say, the frontal lobe is not fully developed. So how, to me, if I was Dr. K, and I know he is, he's, he 
doing great things and fabulous things. How do we build resilience when you are being taunted horribly? Mm -hmm. How do you, being the character who you are and what you believe in, not want to reach out and attack to defend your character, yourself, your school? How do you build resilience with that? The question is for those at home. No, that's that's a great okay. question. Is how do we teach our students to build resilience or um, have a default or something in that situation where they might be uh, personally attacked or in an adverse situation? And part, that's a big one. Sorry. <laughs> Sorry. And it, and it's it's hard even as adults you know we want to defend we want to defend the people whom we love we want to defend ourselves we want to explain and we want to maintain our own safety and so when you start to feel threatened you start to feel threatened and there's not a whole lot you can do at that point so when it gets to the point where you are in that fight or flight or adding more and more all the time but once you get to that point, it's very hard to step back even as an adult and say, oh, okay, like this person is probably really on, like something is going on with them and they're taking this out by making me like the bad guy. Um, but recognizing that as you're starting to get really activated. So talking to your kids about, oh, I can see that you're starting to get upset about this thing. Like, what can you do? Because you can't necessarily stop an avalanche after it starts. Right. right but mm -hmm. you can go back to say like what was going on right before it started and to start to identify when your child is starting to get upset and talking to them because usually you can see it right you can see your kid being like stop 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 and then oh okay now they're getting really annoyed it seems like you're really annoyed with your sister or whatever is going on and talking about those pieces and giving them opportunities to talk about it. This is an, an excellent learning opportunity. So jump on anything. Like my, I have been at the school and then maybe your kid will like share like all sorts of other things. Like what a great opportunity to have on. And so taking those opportunities that you see in the news because your kids are seeing them in the news and anything that's going viral through the school, um, any of those pieces to have conversations with your kids about how can you manage it? And when has there been a time where you really regretted something you did? Like you really let your temper get a hold of you and you said something or did something that you did not want. What would you have wanted to do? What would you have, what were you feeling before you did it? And what do you think you could have done to manage that emotion? Because it's really starting thing right starting the uncomfortable and then the the teen was feeling really threatened right like how do i get this to stop i mean how do you get this to stop and then depending on what you're looking at some parents are encouraging that so being mindful that not everybody is raising their child in the same fashion that you're raising your child and that's okay because we all get to raise our kids the way we want um but recognizing how is it that I want my child to respond. You know, there's that, um, you know, put them on the ground. Like you have a kid making fun of you, like put them on the ground, they won't make fun of you anymore. And so is that really gonna help the situation long-term? Is that a skill that's gonna help them in the workforce or help them at college or help them long-term? And so having those conversations and having the conversations with your, you know, spouse. Yeah. So you're like a united, yeah. united team. Because if um, I say, like, you should just hug them, hug it out, and you say, punch them in the face, <laughs> and what's going to happen? Right. It's a good time to talk about the values, like, that you want to instill in your kids. Um, grace, extending grace, that kind of thing. Um, also, you bring up a good point. And Angela, we talked about this before, too. Parents modeling behavior. So like kids who did well during the pandemic, the parents were, you know, their, their attitude was, well, let's make them like make the most of it. You know, um, those who struggled a bit, the parents were making it big. Then they have nowhere to go because they're looking, you know, to you to help them. 
Um, also, I think it's very easy for us to feel, obviously, for our kids when they're troubled, when they're in the middle of a crisis, that we jump in the boat with them. And I'm guilty of this. That, that, that's why like, I, I'm going to say what I'm going to say next. One, it's our job to pull them out and stand on the shore. It's very easy for us to get wrapped up, too, that we have to remember we're the parent and they're looking to us. You know, friend, are we their friend? Are we their parent in these situations? We're their parent, and we're going to continue to be their parent. Like, my kids are in college now. We have the best conversations, but we have to allow for them to be who they are to judgment. And so anyway, about modeling, uh, modeling behavior, that was yeah. And then I will say, as a therapist who sees teens, lots of teens, particularly girls, will come and say, my mom really wants me to be friends with Sarah. And she just loves Sarah. Sarah can do no wrong. Sarah this, Sarah that. Probably because Sarah, like, did something horrible to you and your mom was like, oh, I can't believe that Sarah, she's terrible. No, that Sarah, she's really great. Or um, I think I mixed my. My explanation, but I think you know what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. The things that you say and the, the way that you respond about their friends stick with them for a long period of time and so um i'll have teens say oh my mom just she just thinks that like so and so is so much better came up in the parent survey is time, time anxiety like a And then there's that just continue. 
continues to grow, just ignore them, <laughs> continues to be an issue with teenagers. Um, and they know it too. They recognize that they can control their phone. And so have a like, how much time are you spending on your phone? And then having the same conversation with you, yourself, how much time am I spending on my phone? You know, my husband will be like, what were you doing? What were you doing the last hour? And it's like, oh, I fell into like my phone hole. I was just thinking around. I was shopping on Amazon. I was That's checking out what was going day. on. <laughs> and so having those conversations about how can we hold ourselves accountable for our time? Because it's really, really sucking a lot more time. You know, 20 years ago, that was not a big piece. There are still time management issues because nobody wants to do the boring things like homework or like chores. But it was a different poll. And now it seems like there's no time, but really if you're looking at your phone and you're getting those um, updates, how many hours a week, what's your percentage going? I have an iPhone, it, it gives me, it holds me accountable. Mm -hmm. And so there are a lot of accountability apps and that's something as a parent that you're not gonna be overly successful with and monitoring your child's phone usage at this stage in the game, right? You are looking at like freshman, sophomore, don't even try it for a junior, it's never gonna work. Um, seniors, right? You're not going to be able to, to snatch their phone away when they come home. If you do, they're going to be really unhappy. They're going to just gonna use their school tablet or their school <laughs> computer to do whatever it is that they needed to do because um, they're probably more techie than the, the tech person who works here. Um, and so having those conversations about time management and just because they're saying, I don't have any time to do these whatever tasks, doesn't mean that they actually don't have the time and it's usually mismanaging the time that you do have. Right. Um, and recognizing we all a little bit do that. Um, one thing I would say, I think your next question is to be like, how do we work with them? Yeah, how can we help them? I um, reached out to Kelly Angelos, who's an academic advisor here. She's phenomenal about anything and everything to do with our students. And um, she did say that she sees uh, an increase of like, they're struggling with prioritizing. Um, and then the, the, the mismanagement of time is affecting their well being. It's affecting, so um, we can even talk about the value of sleep too. Oh, yes, I do love but, sleep. Yeah. So go ahead and say what you're going to say. We actually were just talking about that today, my son and I. Okay. Um, <laughs> right now, so it's a lot of my attention. That's great. Um, not for him, not for You'll <laughs> like it in the future. <laughs> uh, but you were just talking about time management. We're trying to figure out, like, okay, we're going to be able to do all these basketball. We have to really watch our time. If he sets a goal, I mean, it, or is it okay to let him set his goal? Like saying, okay, if I get, I'm going to get all my homework done. If I get done by this time, then I can play a video game with you know, that would be amazing. Okay, then, you know, allow yeah. that and say if it doesn't work, then something else or... Yeah, then we'll try something else because he's driving the, the solution, so he's going to be more apt to do it, right? If you come up with it, because you probably knew that was going to be like a really good reward, right? Get all your stuff done, then you can play your video game. Um, but if you said it, it would have been like, mom's trying to control me, like, ugh. Mm. But if he came up with it and he said, I think that sounds like a great plan, let's try it and let me know if it works. Now, all of a sudden he's, do, he's doing all of the actions and you're just behind him to being the support system because your, your kids are learning what they're gonna need to be adults and to go to college, right? And lots of the kids, particularly from this community go off to school. And so once they go off to school, you can't necessarily keep your eye on them. And so the things that they're learning now, you want them to really mess it up in high school. Like if they're gonna mess something up, do it in high school. Because mm -hmm. when you go to college, the stakes are significantly higher. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> it's true. And then having a conversation first with yourself and maybe with your spouse, or your co-parent about what are the most important things that I think our child should be doing? What are those glass balls that they're juggling right now? Because they might be different from your like co-parent or your partner, and they're definitely gonna be different from your child because there are some things that they cannot stop doing. They can't be like, well, I, I don't wanna go to school anymore, so I'm just not gonna go. Like, okay, that's a glass ball. You can't drop that one. That one has to continue to go. But what are some other things that can? And so if you break it down to what kind of classes are they taking? Are they taking all honors classes? Is that something they really need to do? 
what, what is something in there that they can let some pieces go of? Because as adults, we even have to prioritize where we're putting all of our energy. Like for me today, I, you know, that there are a plethora of things that I had to do and I forgot to do a couple of them, but I was like, okay, well, those will bounce. I'll do those tomorrow. I'll call that person back. I'll do these things tomorrow. Nothing is going to like fall apart, but I made sure to do the things that were really important, like getting here on time, uh, having some coffee made so I could be awake after my bedtime mm -hmm. and doing those pieces. And so recognizing and talking with your child about what are some things that you can let go on. A lot of our kids are very academically inclined. And so they feel like they have to take the highest classes that they absolutely need. But are they taking an honors class? Are they taking an AP class and something that they don't like or don't plan to use? That might be a good opportunity to, to have the conversation. Well, maybe this is not a glass ball for you. What would happen if you got a B in your AP class? Would, it, would you die? Like what would happen? I don't know. Would you lose your big scholarship? Would it really impact you? Um, so those are some pieces. The other pieces could be, do they like the extracurriculars that they're engaged in or where are they spending their, their time at? And so that really is gonna be very family specific um, in terms of where, where can you, where do you see that your child could ease up on some of those pieces? to help them with the stress because they're not going to be 100%, 100% of the time. And then recognizing how do we manage all those responsibilities? Are we getting really frustrated when we mess up or when we um, forget to do something or we don't juggle all of the balls correctly? My absolute favorite thing that Nora Roberts, she wrote all of those um, awesome, um, like, awesome books um, said was she doesn't, she juggles all the balls. The trick is to know which ones are glass and to know which ones are rubber, which ones are going to bounce for you and which ones are going to shatter. And so to start having those conversations with your kids and letting them drop some of them and then see what happens. It, you know, it goes along with the second piece, which I would say is let them fail something, let them really muck it up. Um, when be really mindful, and I see this a lot with um, the teenagers that I work with who say, I just needed a mental health day. So I told my mom I really needed a mental health day. I am so for mental health days. I love them. However, what is going on that they need to use that mental health day or that academic catch up day, which I know is a real thing. Um, they're so overwhelmed. They can't even do it. They don't even know how they're going to do it. They didn't spend their time right. They come to you and they're crying and they're super upset. I just can't figure out how to do this. I just have all this homework and I'm not gonna get the A or I'm not gonna, it's not gonna go well. I need, I need a catch up day. And so then they stay home. And what usually happens from where I sit is they sleep most of the morning and then they get to work and work really hard by the time you see them and you come home from work. But having, starting to let them have those pieces where they fail well, you know, if you didn't get it done, like it's not done, go to school and see what happens. If they need a mental health day, is it really a mental health day or are they trying to avoid something that's really stressful at school, right? And so if they need a mental health day, that's a great opportunity to say, is, is there something you're avoiding? Like why today? What if we planned a mental health day for you? Like we do, we take our PTO, right? On a Friday or even better on a Monday because then you can really enjoy Sunday and talk with them about what that might look like for them. Love that. Um, the value of sleep and how that affects. Yes, teenagers need a ton of sleep, an absolute ton of sleep, and they don't always get it. Um, so they have a hard time going to sleep because they stay up super late, right? And they're on their phones and they're doing all of those wonderful screen activities. And a lot of times what happens, particularly over the summer, is they turn into vampires, where all of a sudden their schedule has shifted so much that they are awake most of the night and sleep almost all of the day. Um, and then when it comes to school, they're trying to do that shift back, but it doesn't necessarily work because over the weekends, they're still staying up really late. And so talking to your child about how can we work some of these pieces through. One of the things I did bring today was I brought one handout. I forgot the other handout. That was another rubber ball. It was my bad. Um, but I did bring a, a really awesome handout that I have um, that I'd like to give to people about getting back into your um, circadian rhythm. And so, you know, it used to be significantly easier when there were no lights and like we all got up when the sun was up and we all went to bed when the sun went down. 
That doesn't necessarily happen. So teenagers, they have way more um, melatonin um, than anyone else. So you will have a lot of um, prescribers prescribe your children melatonin. Oh, just take it, you know, over the counter. Um, it'll help them get sleepy. The problem with that is when you start to use it, it just kicks, it kickstarts your like sleep. But teenagers have so much of it that it doesn't necessarily help them. So the reason it's so hard for teenagers to wake up is because they have so much. It's the reason it's so hard for us as adults to fall asleep is because we have weaned it down and we don't have nearly as much. And so looking at some alternative methods and if you have a teenager that is staying up till like three, four, five o'clock in the morning, having a real conversation about how would we restart this? And one of the solutions they are going to come up with is, I think I should just stay up all night and then stay up the next day <laughs> and go to sleep. And you're going to be like, what? That's crazy. We should try it because it will help. It will help restart that clock because it'll, it'll, um, have them stay up and then you're gonna like you know ham it up for them and be like are you awake are you getting sleepy come on let's go out let's go do these things um and then they're gonna go to bed at a reasonable time and they'll start to reset their their balance but if teenagers do not get enough sleep or they're eating complete crap you're gonna notice and you're gonna know and so you can't necessarily tell your teenager what to eat i mean you make loads of you probably make food um, and they you know at this stage they go out with their friends or they pick different options but looking at what you have in your house what kind of foods do you stock like start slowly destocking all of the processed foods like just start kind of getting rid of them one at a time even for yourself and trying to stock more of those um, like fresh vegetables and encouraging them to have some of those healthier options just by virtue of what's there. Mom, what's there to eat? I don't know, just this big full of fruit. Oh, this is terrible. Okay, grab an apple. Okay, like that's a win. Or instead of having like Doritos have uh, pretzels, like making little, little pieces like that. But the pieces that they put into their body and their amount of sleep is really gonna impact their mood and their resiliency. So if something terrible happens and they're really upset about it. I mean, we've all done it. We, have, we had the night, think back to when your kids were little right? And they weren't sleeping through the night. And then the next day you had something going on and it was like really overly difficult to manage. And you were just like, well, I just can't handle this job anymore. But it's something that you handled on a regular basis beforehand with no problem because you're really sleep deprived and you really, really need that sleep. Mm -hmm. And you touched on some, something that we were talking about before. If something is a big deal and you know, you're hurting for your kid, a lot of times too, you can say, are you hungry? Are you tired? Because a lot of times it's, it's, it goes, you know, hand in hand. We're talking about it conversely here, but mm -hmm. that's another tell as well. Um, let's talk about the feeling of making up for lost time. That was something that came through on the parent survey. Do you see that in the students where they feel this, um, like they lost out on a year. So therefore either they're socializing more. I know it affects them academically and we can talk about that, mm -hmm. but socially over the summer, I don't know. And, and going into the school year, do you see? I saw that a lot, a lot for seniors last year, like a significant amount for seniors last year. And it was, it, even from where I sat, it was a little sad. You know, they had wanted to do all of these things and then they felt like, oh, that was what we were supposed to do. Mm -hmm. And our job as the adults are trying to reframe that in a gentle way for them. Well, I agree, you totally missed out on this. Or you missed out on, you know, going to homecoming or, you know, playing that final rivalry um, sports game. But, you know, I, I am really glad that we had all this extra time to spend together, right? Reframing it in a positive way. You, the whole world has changed and now you can do these things online or now you have more freedom to do these other pieces. Um, for us as parents, we got to spend a lot more time with our kids. Mm -hmm. Like your kid would not probably want to be sitting around the house hanging out with you, but COVID gave us kind of that opportunity. Um, and so the kids that did the best were had flexible parents, more flexible themselves. Mm -hmm. um, and for us, letting your child be upset about that, yeah, well, it's not fair. 
it's not really fair, but that's kind of how it is. So what can you do to balance this moving forward? Because that one year of your academic life is not going to continue to spiral. And there have been other times um, in other generations where, you know, as a senior in high school, you, it wasn't necessarily a pleasant time. And even thinking of like, what's going to happen when um, the, you know, the draft is coming. So having in my life, talking with, with folks who lived through a difficult time, gave it a little bit of perspective. So if they have grandparents around, or that's always a really interesting conversation to have with mm -hmm. teenagers. Um, but for us, just reframing it for them. Yeah, that sucked. Like it did. It wasn't, there wasn't really anything overly positive that we'd be like, yes, this is amazing. But it wasn't 100% horrible. And there were some things that they probably learned or figured out. Mm -hmm. One of those pieces being they got a lot of independence in their academics. Mm -hmm. And right. they're going to need that for college. Yeah. What did you like about being at home? Yeah. I hated all of it. Did you kind of like being able to pretend like you had like a connection problem with that teacher you didn't really like? <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, oh, what? Oh, oh, oh. Yeah. Yeah. That's a big thing. Um, or like muting them or, you know, <laughs> and so having that conversation, rephrasing it, um, in a way that, you know, gets them to talk about it mm -hmm. and you can still recognize it, but they still have to take responsibility for the things that they're doing today. So we can't all say, well, you know, during COVID it was really hard for me. And so I'm never going to go to work again. I'm just going to hang out with my friends. Uh, well, my, my bills aren't going to get paid that way. And so we have to take responsibility and how, how can we find a good balance and opening that up for the conversation where they can figure it out. They'll know, mm -hmm. like they'll have the answer. Mm -hmm. You just have to play kind of stupid and let them come up with it. So um, we were talking about uh, playing catch up, but I want to switch to academically. Um, last year, I don't know how the curriculum is now, but teachers did take it easy on them, um, mm -hmm. rightly so. And so now I don't know if it's like back to normal, like how it was pre. So just the transitioning into making up for that lost time or feeling like they have to play catch up academically. Is there a sense or an anxiety about that? Um, I've heard the term froshmores where sophomores still feel like freshmen and juniors may not be ready to look at colleges because they feel like they lost out last year. So mentally, maturely, maturity wise, they're not mm -hmm. there. So how can we help them regain motivation and drive and focus if it's missing or reframe it in such a way to kind of get them caught up academically? If that's something you see. I definitely see the shock of like sophomores because their freshman year was a lot lighter academically. And like LHS is a rigorous school. Like mm -hmm. there are some intense classes that make me scared. Like I wouldn't want to enroll in them. Um, but that big shift and talking about like, okay, how, and you, you can at LHS, you can actually ask to not have a lunch and go straight through. You can have like, you can have every single AP honors class that they have and have no lunch. Um, and so talking to them about what those boundaries look like, but in terms of academically catching up, they might not necessarily catch up in the same fashion. Um, there are, I talked to a lot of teachers and they're, they, their concern is there's such huge differences in classes that would not necessarily have had big differences because some kids really got onto the online learning and they flourished, mm -hmm. they loved it. It was not distracting, they could get on, they could do their business, they could move on. Some kids did not, right? And so now there are these big gaps um, and, good point. and recognizing it, you know, ultimately it's okay. So your student might not be in the end in the honors classes that they wanted or get to take the, like the classes that they get to take at LHS because they are, took all of their sciences already, but there'll be other times for that. And so being a little lenient in terms of, you know, you'll get there when you get there, just keep working and doing the best that you can. The same attitude that like 99% of parents are having about their academics um, and talking to them about what are the classes that you like. And so instead of being like, I want you to apply for college, like what do you, what would you want to do? Like mm -hmm. what is interesting to you? And finding that motivating piece instead of, 
asking him like, well, what cool school do you want to go to? Mm-hmm. Oh, geez, I don't know what school I want to do. What would you find interesting? What do you find interesting now? What classes are you like? I love going to this class and why? Is it because you like socializing with joy? <laughs> Maybe. <laughs> or is it like, oh, the teacher, she's hilarious. Okay, mm-hmm. well, what's hilarious about her? Oh, it just, just makes things so easy to learn. Maybe this is where, you know, this is something that you like. Mm-hmm. And so trying to motivate them through finding the things that they enjoy mm-hmm. instead of trying to motivate them to like, look at these schools, look at all these schools. Okay, what things are you enjoying? What are you interested in? Oh, I always thought I wanted to be a nurse. Oh, okay. I wonder what schools out there have good nursing programs. And then see what happens. Mm-hmm. Because if you try to force them or bring them or sit down, you have to work on these. It's going to be a it's going to be a huge fight. Mm-hmm. Dr. K mentioned at one of the parent cats meetings last year of reframing the question of you know what major what what major do you want to pursue to what problems do you want to solve? You know, um, kind of leading to what's important to your student. Um, I want to talk about it's it's five to eight, so I want to uh, respect people's time and get a couple questions, and then we'll open it up for Q and A. But um, relationships and friendships. So um, during lockdown, you know, we we knew there was a big concern about students feeling isolated. Um, we even came up with ways that they could get to meet people, like a kickball league, um, but safely done, you know, just so they can still socialize. But Uh, You said some thrived, which I know they did. Um, Mm -hmm. Some people uh, fell into depression. Some were, you know, saw kids together on social media. So that might have created some kind of, well, what about me? You know, my parents won't let me leave the house. So there's kind of a lot of things going on. Mm -hmm. Um, So now that we're back to in person, what would you say to students who feel um, like they might have lost touch because of being at home or they don't have a friend base through extracurricular activities how do we get them to to socialize if if they feel they lost that or are shy to begin with i mean it's an anxiety producing thing anyway making friends and shifting friend dynamics and what has happened is those peripheral friends have vanished and now they they have to start to rebuild those and they're awkward that that was just like the you know, the classmate friends, the extracurricular friends. And so encouraging them, even if they're feeling awkward or like really anxious about connecting with other people, like go and see and asking them, what's the worst thing that could possibly happen if you talk to Joy in your Spanish class? Like, is she, what, what could happen? Well, she could just like not answer me back. What would, why, like, I don't understand. Well, tell me why that would be so horrible, right? Because they think like that I would die, I'd die from embarrassment, but maybe they wouldn't. And so encouraging them to participate in things, saying yes to things, um, asking them what else, what other pieces are around. One of the biggest things that I would really highly recommend, particularly if you have anxious children, um, getting a job, not a babysitting job where they're like managing the little kids, but like a job at like Pizza Hut or Target or being a hostess or a host somewhere. Those are so amazing. I see the biggest growth in teenagers who come in really, really struggling with social anxiety, anxiety in general, and they get this job and it is the scariest thing that they're going to do, but they do it. They go on the interview and you're like, how was that? I can't believe you did it. I'm so proud of you. That's so amazing. I wonder if you'll get it. And then they get the job and they're like happy for like 35 seconds. And then it goes into like the sheer panic of having a job. But after they manage that, their ability to like survive and, and thrive in other difficult situations is, is, is set up. Even as like as a therapist, that's what I go back to. When was a time that was really scary for you to do something? Oh, it was never this scary. What about when you applied for that job at Target? Remember how scared you were and we had to talk about it? Even as a parent, reminding them that they've gone through things that were really scary mm-hmm. and they survived them and something maybe good came out of it. They got a little pocket money or they learned how to talk to people. Um, that's like one of the steps I have in like graduating the teenagers I work with who are really high anxiety. Like, okay, now you need to go find a job that you have to talk to strangers. That's like right? Scary for us. Nobody wants to talk to a stranger. Um, but having those pieces can be really helpful. And then, and giving them the opportunity to be 
who they want to be and a location that nobody really necessarily knew them in the past. Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't always have to be academically based and it doesn't have to be extracurricular based. Mm -hmm. um, and there are even opportunities to, to volunteer and not just volunteer once, but encourage your child, like, let's make this, let's make this a thing for your resume. Well, I want you to like really get into it. Like, what would you like to volunteer at? How would you like to spend your time? Mm -hmm. And getting a job in a place where there's a lot of people, it takes the pressure off of, of the student mm -hmm. because there's just so much, you know, going around that they have to tend to anyway, and they're in the mix of it. Um, uh, one last question that we have is with regards to drugs and alcohol during you know the the pandemic and um and either before and after have you seen a, a shift in usage among i have in my practice i haven't seen a significant shift but that does not mean that it's not there mm -hmm. the um, suicide rates during covid increased and the consumption of alcohol increased mm -hmm. i mean even we talked about at, and my family we did a wednesday night like night like specialty drink like mm -hmm. every wednesday during covid because we you know couldn't go anywhere couldn't do anything it was my sister it was my little pod right my sister my folks and we all sat down and had like a cocktail which i don't typically do mm -hmm. but alcohol consumption as a whole increased in addition to the fact that now we have um dispensaries so we have marijuana dispensaries and that is becoming more of a norm piece mm -hmm. and both of those alcohol alcohol tobacco and um, THC are, are really dangerous and harmful for the children and their like decision making, but also their developing brains. And so they can also be very self medicating because when I have a, a little bit to drink and I go to these parties, I don't feel like everybody's watching me. Mm -hmm. And so that piece is, has always and will continue to be a big piece um, for our high schoolers mm -hmm. in particular. Um, and then as the is the just the growing acceptance of THC use and cannabis and gummies and um, continues to grow, that will be a bigger piece also because it's being normed in the culture. And to this day, alcohol is still the biggest addictive substance that we have and causes the most issues in terms of um, behavioral health providers. And so being aware of that and having some conversations with your children around it mm -hmm. um, and not scaring off of the topic. Yeah. How do we have, have those check-in conversations without being accusatory or, you know, like mm -hmm. having them feel that we're coming at them? Are you drinking? Yeah, it's, it's not going to be great if you directly stand in front of them and be like, what's going on? Okay, my for a second, I'm like, like, oh, oh, no, no, oh my gosh. <laughs> um, there will be the opportunity for somebody online that has done something embarrassing while they were high or while they were drunk, just in the same way that these teenagers are making bad decisions here, right? And that's your opportunity to like jump on. What happened? Why do you think that was? And to then flip that to, if you go to a party, is there usually drinking there? Like, right? You're mm -hmm. just, you want to elicit some like conversation and not be like, are you drinking? And what are you drinking? And how much are you drinking? And what's going on? Mm -hmm. There are some hallmarks of um, drinking that is very concerning. And spe specifically, if you look up um, the craft, I think it's, uh, let's see if I can pull it out. Did I write it down? Oh, I did. That's so helpful for me. It's like, um, so we do want to have conversations and elicit that general feedback. Like, what, what is going on when you go to the parties? What do you say when you don't want to drink? What do other people say? Do you think they regretted the, whatever it was that happened? You know, they were online dancing on a table or, or those types of pieces. Um, and then there's, there's an assessment it's called the craft. And so it talks about if your teenager was ever ever rode in a car with someone who was higher drinking, um, if they use alcohol or drugs to relax, if they use alcohol or drugs while they're alone, if they forget things that they did, if their friends or their family have ever told them they use too much, um, and if they've ever gotten too in trouble. And so the the hallmark of those is if your teen can say yes to two of those, mm -hmm. then that's a that's a big red flag. And so we want to definitely circle back and have conversations um, with your co-parent, with your spouse, um, and then talk about what are some of the issues that are going on? Because um, I, we can all, 
probably a test. So like those all sound like really scary pieces. Um, and most of our kids are not going to be the ones that are like going ham, but a lot of a lot of kids are drinking. And so we want to have those conversations and have our expectations laid, particularly before they go off to college. Mm -hmm. I know, I'm sorry, I'm coming in. Half no, no, so we're, things, we're good. Just opening up. Thing, like, um, I hear a lot of this from my end. Is what could be three things that you could say to your teenager about drugs or alcohol? And by that, I mean more facts. Like, I'm always not trying to scare them, but trying to point out a fact. Because I feel like that registers a little bit more with them than, you know, I don't know. So does that make sense? So like, what, what would be like three facts maybe you would say as it pertains to either weed smoking or alcohol that could stick with them? And you can stick ponder Well, I'm going to have to ponder, ponder that. Ponder But I was yeah. going to yeah. say, yeah. Elizabeth. Okay. Oh, yeah. Pencil back there. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Elizabeth. Hi, Hi. 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 Hi.
rules and expectations and isn't that nice for her kids but my kids have to get up and put their clothes on and do mm -hmm. the things and having those conversations and being okay with being the mom who says like I don't it's not okay with me I mm -hmm. don't want you to do those things like my expectations for you is this yes and when we parent um and we stand to like what we believe our kids will appreciate it yeah they will leave high school or or even still be in high school I guarantee we have those conversations with our kids now. And when they go off to college, like we're setting themselves up by saying, this is what we expect for you. And it's all out of love. That's what they're going to hang on to. Cause that's, that's the only thing that will tether them to what's the right thing to do in this situation. They'll, they'll listen to what you said, even though they might not act like it now. Yeah. They're going to roll their eyes. Yeah. And then and then doing, you know, what probably most of our parents did to us, like if you ever need to get picked up or if there's ever something you're uncomfortable with, you know, the big thing that was going around was like, just text me an X and I'll come pick you up or I'll call you and say, you have to come home right now. Or, you know, if you're in a situation, you just don't know what to do. I'm not going to be, I want you to call me, call me, call like, or if you have like an aunt, you know, like you, if you have your sister lives like, you know, in the same community, you can always call, you know, aunt you can always call Aunt Carrie and she will, you know, do whatever needs to happen and having those pieces. Or if you have a friend that just needs to be taken home or you're worried about, I'm not going to blow them up. I'm just going to pick them up and take them to their home where they can be safe. Um, so recognizing and having those conversations and just reinforcing that it's okay to let me know if you're uncomfortable or if you made a bad decision. I'm never going to stop loving you. The worst decision you ever make, I'm still going to love you for it. And our kids truly forget that because they think that their worst decision is who they are mm -hmm. and that there's something they could possibly do that would stop us from loving them. And that's, we know that that's not the case. Mm -hmm. I always um, said to myself that if I screw up this parenting thing, as long as they know that they were loved, then I did something, you know? So I think that's a great um, thing to tell your child, like whatever you do, I'm still gonna love you. Like it, it creates a space for them to be able to open up to you. But um, okay, so we want to open it up to you parents, you parents at home, for any questions related to what we were talking about with regards to motivation and, and like how it's affected the person you're talking to. Um, do we have any feedback from our very young students so far on how they're structuring the house? How is that? Maybe they were feeling last year. How that played out, you know, like how their classes are going. Like, do we have any kind of information on that? That's I, what I think about. Um, yeah, right. Next year. Mm -hmm. how, how was the motivation piece? And then how did it Yeah, because these are the times, and some kids. Some kids will get more motivated when it's all on their own because then they have that pressure of doing it themselves. But the best predictor of future behavior is past behavior, mm -hmm. just in general. Um, I have a really <laughs> skewed view. I will say I have a very skewed view because I work in the clinical realm. And oftentimes if a child is not 100% ready to go off to college, they don't always flourish in college because it's a difficult place. And so from my personal perspective, or my professional perspective, it doesn't always necessarily work out so positively, but there are other pieces in there. So I'm not, I don't have any research about how that um, was that graduating class of 2021, 20, right? 20, yeah, 2021 20, 20, 20, 20, yeah. um, is doing in terms of moving to their next step. I know some classes are still, some colleges are still doing online learning. Um, I have a daughter who's a freshman. Yeah. Um, she and her friends and I keep in touch with uh, her friends as well. They're doing fine. Um, LHS in general prepares the kids really well academically. And like, I mean, <laughs> so I, a lot of times I hear the freshman year at college that it was so easy for them to adjust. But I think also the piece that my older son um, who is done with college was watching my daughter and he's like, well, now you know what college is like, because you can just roll out of bed, you know, open up your laptop and it's kind of like, well, are you going to attend this class? Well, I don't know. Maybe it's like a, you know, a break based on their black schedule. So it was, 
they kind of had a taste of that. And I don't think, I think they're all doing really well. I think they also feel like it's that much sweeter because they went through that. Um, but I also feel, at least what I've seen is they have uh, a connection to their high school friends because they were just starting to get to know like some people as they were leaving you know, for college that there's um, a closer bond because of what they went through. And then now that they went to college, they're all excited, you know, to, to um, come back. On that, my daughter graduated two years ago, so they were the ones that didn't have the graduation. Yeah. She mm -hmm. went to college and she said, she's glad that she went when she did. Yeah. Fortunately, she had, she was, I don't know what's different. She was, this is my, you know, I didn't, I liked going in as a freshman in the pandemic because I can't say, Oh, I missed out on this. You know, she was she says you know senior year she was bored, but going in as a freshman in college, she goes, this is all new for me. So she made it up as she went, mm -hmm. and I mean she's doing well. Never talked to her because she's always busy. But, um, mm -hmm. but they Ellie just did prepare her very well um, for going to the yeah. That's good. Kind of a follow up question to what you alluded to with your freshman how you're. Uh, college, so when I know what college is like, you know, so our, you know, these kids kind of got a taste of what I thought too, so my first conception was like college, a lot of independence, um, uh, you know, with a lot of schedules, kind of like it might be in college, <coughs> and, um, only a few classes, you know, each day, and um, long lunch breaks, and things like that, um, so go out for lunch, you know, go to the car, uh, in some ways, it seems like some of the seniors had the current seniors. I, I almost felt like last year when my son was a junior, he was ready to go off to college. It kind of felt like his junior year was his senior year. Mm -hmm. I don't know if that's a common, other parents feel that way, that um, because of the way life was, mm -hmm. the amount of independence and flexibility there was in their schedule, that um, they were not even really ready to go off to college. Separated, like, is that natural separation that happens when parents and kids can break off college? Have you experienced that at all? Sounds like you did a great job parenting yeah, the pandemic, <laughs> <laughs> but, right? Because that's what we want to see. Well, we want to see right, our kids. Yeah, I'm thankful that you know, it was, you know, those healthy things. You got outside, and it's mm -hmm. difficult. Uh -huh. But um, it just, you know, <laughs> he's not ready to go to college quite yet, so it's like. Navigating this year. Yeah, it's yeah. almost like for him, if he was ready to go, and then now it's like, oh, he was ready to launch, yeah, and now he's standing back. Right. So there's a little more tension there because he, he felt like he was ready to launch. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then you utilizing that for that's your motivation to make sure that you get your applications in or mm -hmm. you decide where you want to go because I know that you're going to thrive mm -hmm. when you go to college because I was able to see it before and looking at what kind of additional like independence can you grant him that he doesn't necessarily already have because you he's earned that ability because you've been able to see him you know manage his time well and, and manage his responsibilities mm -hmm. and there comes a time where you know we we parent and we'll continue to parent but our role shifts to being a coach you know to now talk to me you know as an adult and it's really neat to see when they make that that transition. Um, any other questions? Yeah. I have a question. Um, my name is Laura, and I have a freshman. And um, what I've noticed with him is before COVID, we were being super social, and I was being stuck with his friends, and then COVID came, um, and I explained it to you know, some friends where it was like, no COVID bubble, and they with all their friends and then they come into a new school um, which was kind of a shock to the system you go from we're not going anywhere and not going to live interaction to a brand new school new teachers all these kids being on sports team and having practices five days a week all of the homework it was very stressful mm. um, and he 
he, he, you know, he's fine. I mean, he's doing great, but he actually went and saw a counselor mm -hmm. on his own a couple of days in a row because he just felt like, you know, he felt just too much. But now what I'm seeing is that um, he doesn't want to participate in extracurricular all the things that he used to do that he used to enjoy. And he had his friends after school you know, going to the football game and um, you know on Friday nights and then, you know just all the normal things that he wants to stay home. Mm -hmm. I'd rather stay home. He doesn't want to be comfortable. Yeah. Comfortable, mm -hmm. right? I have a child in the same situation. Yeah. And I've heard it from quite a few parents that are not alone in their own way. Mm -hmm. Especially people that are kids that may know are are your kids enjoying being home like yes. are they is he gaming with his friends or I mean, we will watch tv together we i mean we have dinner together I mean, he, he's very social he's social and happy and mm -hmm. um he just wants to be home all the time just go do something with your friends like mm -hmm. this is your time i don't know if he is that my daughter not so much okay the gaming might be his gaming. social mm -hmm. snapchat she thinks that he's her friend mm. <laughs> i mean seriously like mm -hmm. i mean, I, found, I figured that out like that that's their interaction mm -hmm. if they, because that's what they learned yeah yeah it's just yeah comfortable. yeah so maybe it's just the age of 14 and trying to figure out themselves mm -hmm. and can you stay, you know, like if they're all on their phones, like nothing is better than human interaction, like face-to-face -face interaction. Like, can their friends come over? Well, but then they bring their demons. Mm. <laughs> but that like, but that's maybe that's their, their yeah, yeah, maybe so that's. Like these monitors, mm -hmm. like they're coming in yeah. for a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, then, and then I would say, like, come up, like, let's clear out the dining room table. We'll sit you guys down or whatever that is. And, and meet him where he is because maybe that's where he is for right now. Yeah. It probably will not stay that way if he if he's interested like in a relationship with somebody else, you know, that'll bring different dynamics in. Mm -hmm. um, but in terms of if there's still some socializing, like his mood is still good, he's doing the things that he needs to be doing, he just enjoys being at home, then I would say enjoy that time because he will mm -hmm. not be there forever. Mm -hmm. um, next year, because uh, Brock was a junior and his whole freshman year, Really? Oh yeah. Okay. I think it's he, it's pretty it video games. It took oh, and then yeah. at like end of freshman year and sophomore year, I was like, Oh, where did he go? Who is this? You're <laughs> never home anymore. And he was just I and he's still gone. So that has been my experience. Well, it's a beautiful thing that he's happy, yeah. like he's content yeah. being at home. Yeah. That's a good thing, you know? And I think too. There's a transition that happens like between freshman and sophomore yes. year where the friends and that whole thing starts changing. I know one of my sons, um, you know, he's active. He is an introvert, but he was on basketball. He did, um, he stayed home more. And some of his friends were making decisions that he was not comfortable with. So I'd rather, it was tough because then he made the decision of, being less social, but he was more comfortable with where he was and, and knew that he was living his life the way he wanted to. So that could be like a transitional thing too, but you're saying that he's content. Yeah, maybe just bring him on over, <laughs> you know, like <laughs> a whole crew, because then you can be there and you can like right. get snacks and you can hear them talk and it's like, they light up, you know? So that's, that's great, yeah. Any other, are there questions in the chat, Donna? No. Okay. Do you know what I do want to touch back? Because you touched, I think we got off on another topic when you were talking about what is regular teenage behavior and what is like clinical problems and mm -hmm. like what, what are the things we're supposed to look at? Because I've had counselors say to me, it's hard 
it's hard to tell because teenagers are crazy. Like, yeah. like you know, like like you said, that's the very technical term. They could be depressed. Is, sure. is that like a problem, or is that going to be gone tomorrow? And yeah. you know, how do you assess that? I would. So the two things look for is there like a really specific um, trigger that started these things? Is that I am upset because my friends did this or my friend group is doing this or these types of things and then keep an eye on how long that lasts because right as they're as they're teenagers this is right where some of those like depressive symptoms are coming up we start seeing a lot of the anxiety disorders um and right around like 16 17 18 like things start to get kind of supercharged um so if they are having um you know, if they are really upset about something, they're crying themselves to sleep the first night, like, okay, that's, sometimes those things happen. The second night, still upset. The third night, still upset. Okay, I want to keep my eye on this. Like, what is exactly going on? If your child is doing um, harmful behaviors to themselves, if they are talking about wishing to be gone, or the world would be a better place if I'm not here, sometimes as we get mad, it would just be better if I wasn't even born. Okay. And then coming back, like, are you still really feeling like that? Um, and circling back with that conversation. Um, so looking at how long things are happening and then the duration, like the duration and the severity. So is it really, really intense and it's just continuing on? So lots of times things happen and they get really sad and then they kind of bounce back out of it. Two weeks later, you're like, oh, that was just like a really difficult time. Okay. But if it's lasting for an entire week and you're seeing this really low mood, or if they're having a really difficult time managing their anxiety and you're seeing it because they're just like constantly talking about the same things over and over and over and over and over again and they cannot let it go then looking at like what are some ways we can try to let some of this go because that is really really common that that like high anxiety um particularly at this age group because there's a lot of stress to like do all things um and if they are no longer sleeping, if they get worried when there's nothing to be worried about, like they're absolutely fine and they're having a great time. And then all of a sudden they're like, I feel like I should be worried about something. And then they start to get worried because they're not worried. That's a significant hallmark of an anxiety disorder. Mm -hmm. And so when everything is going fine and all of a sudden they get really anxious for no reason, um, it's because they're not comfortable with not being anxious. That mm -hmm. makes sense. I think I've got a disorder. I know, right? <laughs> and we're all checking ourselves because we're like, you I do that too. I should have been worried. Um, but that's a that's one of the big hallmarks. Yeah, you can have yeah, you can have that conversation. They do have counselors here. Um, and they have like LHS has really great support systems and I would definitely recommend like, Hey, have you talked to your school counselor? Do you even know who they are? Like, why don't you go check them out? Because, um, they have the ability to like be right down the, you know, um, I won't say street hall from them. Mm -hmm. And most of the time when our teens are having anxiety, it's late at night and it's at school, mm -hmm. right? It's not when they're like having fun, playing sports or doing those things. It's like right before they go to bed, which is when you're like the judgment center, your prefrontal cortex starts to shut down. That's why we get anxious when we go to sleep too. We're like, oh, I forgot to do this. Oh, I forgot to do this. And then when they're at school. And so having that conversation and cueing the, the school social worker in, you can even call and be like, hey, I'm, I'm Gina. Um, my daughter, Savannah, is a freshman in school. We're a little concerned that she might be having some anxiety. Is it okay if you check in on her? Or can I give her, like, direct her to come and talk to you? I think that's an excellent idea because the other thing we learned from our student panel is that every kid said there's absolutely no way I would ever go to my counselor here because mm -hmm. the way that they're set up, everyone can Everybody see knows. that you're walking in and they can see that you're going there and they're, it's like it's this big deal. So mm -hmm. I love that suggestion. Like, call, then they just get called down and nobody, mm -hmm. and nobody knows. Yeah. So, I mean, you can get pretty sneaky with it. Um, I mean, I obviously, I encourage you to seek professional counseling. There are two things that you should be aware. It's really difficult to get into a counselor right now if you're working to do that. Um, and I think that's just, um, that'll probably maintain pretty consistently for the next 
year or so. Um, that doesn't mean that you shouldn't try or reach out and, and find one that would be a good fit for your family. Um, but also recognizing there are other resources right around here and what can you do to like get some coaching or um, lots of teenagers are be like poo poo on groups. Like in groups can be really great um, but teenagers do not want to be in another group with somebody that they might see somewhere else. Like mm -hmm. it, it, they would True. rather die than attend a group like that. Yeah. Um, the benefit of some online stuff is finding groups that are not based in this community. Mm -hmm. Right. Like I don't necessarily want to go to my home community and spill my guts and then see them mm -hmm. at my work the next day. There was an app that youth and family counseling had. Um, they started it last year. I don't know if they still have it, but it's for people who it's not necessarily like, like a, an acute, a disorder um, where it's like for where the, uh, the majority of students might reside on anxiety. Well, you probably know more about it because you were there when there. Yeah, I'm not sure right. what the step. Yeah. Right. So youth and family counseling, I was the clinical director there for the last five years. Um, I actually recently transitioned to, I work for the man, I work in the insurance company now. Uh, um, but you also have your own practice. I do have my yeah. own practice. Um, they, there are lots of apps that are, are really helpful. Um, youth and family counseling has an app called Thrive that was really um, being developed and was really a cool opportunity for, for kids to get some additional supports. And then there are tons of other um, apps that can be really helpful for kids because they don't necessarily want to hear you say like, let's take some deep breaths, right? Mm -hmm. They'll be like, oh my gosh, mom, this is too much. Even as a therapist, like kids will literally roll their eyes at me. Like we're going to do breathing. Like, oh. and you're like, oh, yeah, we kind of are. Um, but they will take that advice from someone on TikTok and they'll take it from an app. Yeah. Right. right. If I got on TikTok and showed everybody how to breathe, they'd be like, oh, this girl is so cool. Like, well, she's learned teaching us really good skills um, and finding those pieces. And there are really like awesome people who are teaching great things on TikTok. And so if you can find them and then like cue them in on it, um, that will be helpful also. Mm -hmm. Okay. And there's another local agency too that I think they're accepting um, new clients because they're still building out their department is MTC, uh, Mobile Therapy Centers. It's right on, uh, off of Winchester. But um, any other questions? I want to make sure that we address everyone's concerns. Okay. Well, Gina Tober, thank you so yeah. much. I love coming to talk to you guys. It's always really fun. It's so great, like the things you say off, you know, just off the top of your head. And it's hard to say no. <laughs> we appreciate that. So <laughs> and thanks to everyone for coming too. You know what? And I think Gina and Google would I think all of us could have gone on all night about like things about addictions and that. And so mm -hmm. we, our next meeting, we're really gonna dive into that. That's why we didn't want to touch too much on that um tonight. So our next meeting we're gonna have a lot of um some experts and a panel and, and talk about that kind of stuff. So mm -hmm. please come back. <laughs> Oh, the real talk? Yeah. Oh. Not in the fall, but we're talking about, usually um, we'll partner with LHS, they'll do a real talk in the fall and then in the spring. The fall is more focused around drug and alcohol uh, prevention. And then the spring is mental health. So they didn't do it this past fall. Um, so they're looking to see what they should focus on in the spring. Yeah. But um, yeah, so Elizabeth from Libertyville Connect, um, your team is going to be a part of this discussion too. So any questions? Yeah, you can direct them to us. All right. Well, thank you so much. I do. I have a little handout on. It's helpful for adults too. I, I love it. I hand it out to everybody. I message all of.